There are seven sneaky editing mistakes sabotaging your landscape photos and preventing your photography from reaching the next level. In this video, I'll show you what they are so you can correct these mistakes, elevate your editing skills and achieve stunning results. Starting off with mistake number one that Adobe have inadvertently made more common after releasing a new feature that's supposed to make things easier for us photographers. And if you're not paying close attention, then there's every chance this is giving your images an amateurish appearance to anyone who looks closely. And the problem is halos, and they're created when you mask an adjustment into your image poorly, and it causes the effect to go over the edges of what you're meaning to adjust. In this example of masking a curves adjustment into the dark rocks to lighten them, a halo is created when the effect spills over into the sky. And the reason Adobe made this more common is because of how popular the Select Object tool is. When I use the Select Object tool to select these dark rocks, it appears to do a good job. And then when I add a curves adjustment layer, the selection is then added to the layer mask, meaning that I can increase the brightness with the curve and only the stuff that's inside the original selection is actually brightened. So that's pretty good. But when we look closely, we can see the selection Photoshop created wasn't accurate enough and we see this halo appear. So these halos can be prevented in the first place by using a more accurate selection technique and my free luminosity masking plugin for Photoshop will actually help you with that. And there's a link in the description. But for now, here's how to fix halos like this so that you can quickly correct any past edits that might suffer from them without having to re-edit the whole thing. So first you wanna add a new layer to your image and then set its blend mode to darken and then select the clone stamp tool and set the sample drop down to all layers Next, with the clone stamp tool, sample a part of the sky that's close to the halo, and then simply trace the halo along the edge of the object, and it's just gonna disappear. So that is as long as you haven't made editing mistake number two, which is brightening dark objects too much. The halo fix that I just described will work as long as the object is still darker than the sky behind it, which it probably should be because it's virtually silhouetted against the bright background, especially in this example. But regardless of halos, you should avoid over brightening dark objects for another important reason. And that is that when you push things too far, you tip the balance of what should be bright and what should be dark. Now it's very tempting to reveal a lot of detail in the shadows, especially when you have a camera with a good dynamic range or you're blending bracketed exposures. And the same thing goes for the highlights too when making them dark and richly saturated to bring out the colors. Your photos will end up looking very unnatural if you skew the relationship between shadows and highlights. Instead, what you should try to do is maintain an appropriate relationship between the highlights and the shadows in your images. That is if you don't want them to look weird and like an overprocessed bad HDR, which just happens to be what editing mistake number three will also lead to. Now the mistake is editing the same way for different types of images. So for example, taking what works well for a colorful sunrise or sunset image, and then using it in exactly the same way for a midday blue sky photo. And I think it happens because people tend to learn and practice their Photoshop skills on these spectacular colorful raw files. But it turns out that those scenes are not what most people's image catalogs are full of because those conditions are actually pretty rare. So when they come to edit a midday blue sky landscape, making the same contrast and color boosting adjustments on the sky leads to this unnatural and unrealistic overprocessed appearance. To fix this mistake, what you should do is base your editing decisions on the specific image and don't just blindly follow the same steps and techniques that you've learned on every single photo. Now the fix for editing mistake number seven is actually gonna go miles towards helping you solve this one too. But first, editing mistake number four isn't necessarily about something you might be doing wrong, but it's more about something you might not be doing at all. It's a common trap for photographers to fall into because we all want as much image as possible and our cameras capture so much incredible amounts of data nowadays and it feels like a shame to waste it by cropping a photo and reducing its number of pixels. But let me ask you a question. Would you rather have a full resolution photo with an okay composition or a slightly reduced resolution photo with a perfect composition? The mistake I see so many photographers making is ignoring composition issues and not fixing them with a simple crop. So I recommend that you don't get hung up about losing pixels or feeling like you should have gotten it perfect in camera. The fact is once your photo is in Photoshop, that's what you're working with those are the ingredients. To ignore a simple crop that makes a better composition is like making a banoffee pie and refusing to peel the bananas because you don't want to waste anything. Editing mistake number five, on the other hand, is definitely about doing less. Now, there's a certain group of edits that contributes heavily to an overprocessed, amateurish looking edit. And the bad thing is that each one in that group has a handy slider in Lightroom and Camera Raw that makes it all too easy to overdo them. Now, personally, I tend to avoid those particular sliders in Lightroom and ACR altogether so I can give my images the same kind of results that those sliders are trying to give you 
but in a more subtle and refined way in Photoshop. Clarity, texture, and sharpening all deal with enhancing the micro contrast in the small details of your image in one way or another. Now, for one thing, it's rarely appropriate to apply the same amount of any one of these effects to your whole image at once. But besides that, they're easy to get carried away with and overdo, and it's a fine line between just enough and totally overcooked. Instead, I recommend asking yourself why you want to use one of those effects in the first place, and then strive for that same outcome with a combination of more subtle sharpening and contrast techniques in Photoshop. But like I said, it's a fine line between just enough and totally overcooked editing, and it's not always easy to see exactly where that line is, especially if you're making editing mistake number six, which is editing your images from start to finish in one sitting without taking a break. Now, why do I say that? Well, in the same way that when we put on a pair of socks in the morning, we feel them on our feet for the next minute or two, but after a little while, we become desensitized to them and don't feel them at all. Now our eyes can actually become desensitized to the colors and contrast of our images as we're processing them. So what we think looks good one moment, after our perception resets with a short break, it actually looks different to us later. If you've ever edited an image one day and then gone back to it the next and your first thought when you opened up Photoshop was, what on earth was I thinking yesterday? Then this is probably why. Now, if you've ever wondered why you can take multiple photos from the same location at the same time, but find it really difficult to get them looking the same in editing, or if you're struggling to develop a consistent style to all of your editing, then you might be suffering from the effect of editing mistake number seven. You've probably heard the famous quote that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Now to understand mistake number seven, I'm gonna flip that saying around. Insanity is doing different things over and over and expecting the same results. So when you think about it, it's the only logical reason for a lack of consistency in your editing. But the good news is that you can start fixing this mistake now by creating or following a step-by-step -step workflow where you actually do the same things in the same order each time. This doesn't mean do the same exact edits every time, and we covered why that's a bad idea in mistake number three. What it means is grouping your edits together into a certain order and making the same decisions at the same points in your editing process each time. And that way, you're gonna achieve consistent outcomes. Over 54,000 photographers so far have downloaded my free guide, which teaches you my six step workflow to make it easy to get consistently good results from Photoshop. And you can grab it for free yourself on the link in the description and a pinned comment.